Hey everyone, this is a mini pod for Find Your Film. This is sort of a redux of our first, maybe first couple of episodes of Find Your Film when Eric Holmes chose William Friedkin for his director's spotlight. So we're coming back right now again with what Eric Holmes, do you remember the movies we covered? Bruce, do you remember the movies we covered for that William Friedkin spotlight? We did As- Good Time. We did Killer Joe. I, yeah, we did Sorcerer and the, the documentary. The People and versus can't... Paul Crump. The there People you versus go. Paul Crump, which was very interesting. Surprisingly, a very good documentary. Guys, do you remember how good that mo- that doc was? My goodness. Yeah. yeah. There were some shots in The People versus Paul Crump that they, they did a I remember Freakin did a reenactment of a robbery, I believe, at the beginning. And it's better than most reenactments you'll see on network television or, or cable now. The way it was wow. it was shot in a cinematic fashion, even though it was a black and white doc. Anyways, there's a lot of there's still a lot of mo- movies of Freakin that we haven't covered. Oh my gosh, I love Sorcerer. But this one specifically, I decided to pick The Hunted because it's it's personally one of my favorite William Freakin movies. And then I decided to throw a flyer at Jade because it's a movie that I haven't seen. I've interviewed Joe Esterhaus a couple of times. Nice guy. He's a screenwriter writer from Basic Instinct and he's a screenwriter for Jade. Yeah. Eric Holmes, you said, you've said uh, you said that uh, William Friedkin has not directed a bad movie. Do you still stand by that assertion? I do. But I'm, I'm kind of trying to read the room and I'm thinking you, you may disagree you have, with. You, you don't have to read anything. <laughs> when it comes to cinema, cinema it, there's no such thing as cinema illiteracy. Yeah. Know, I, I just said on the last episode how awesome I thought Sweet Girl was. So I, everyone has their own yeah. taste. Everyone has their own taste. <laughs> By the way, Sweet Girl on Netflix. Go check it out. I, I kind of really dug it. You can holler at me later or yell at me. No, but that's not about Sweet Girl. We're here about Jade. You're trying to read the room about how I feel about Jade. And we're, I'm going to, I have, are you excited about this mini pod? Bruce Perky, are you? I'm trying to read Bruce Perky to see how he feels about. <laughs> I'm excited about this mini pod. Uh, yeah, I am yeah, so yeah. excited about this mini pod. Okay, I'm okay. So excited, so excited. Oh, and he's wearing the cinematic shirt. Oh, that's a show that I do with <laughs> Anderson Cowan, my my better on that on that episode on the, on that show here. My betters are Eric Holmes and Bruce Perky. You know what? Without further ado, there's not going to be a lot of movie facts here. Here's the thing: we're going to break down. Jade and the Hunted, and I'm going to throw this out to you guys, but we're going to talk about it. We're going to give our mini reviews, and then we're going to get into spoilers. So this episode will be value added as far as if you want to see Jade or the Hunted, we'll give you our recommendations or not. And then afterwards, we're going to do a very quick recap at the end. So we're going to actually make sure that the spoilers are not front loaded. So you can actually, if you have not seen either film, just enjoy this, this podcast for most of it, and then just dump yourself out at the end when we briefly talk about the ending, okay? Now let's start off first with Jade. Jade was released in 1995, directed by William Friedkin, written by Joe Esserhaus. And here's the thing, around this time, David Caruso was considered possibly a box office A-list actor because he had just come off a really successful run, albeit short run with NYPD Blue. He wanted to transition to cinema, to feature films, and Jade was pretty much, along with Kiss of Death, these were his launching pad films to starring in movies. Here's the thing. He, this plot centers on a assistant district attorney played by David Caruso. He plays David Corelli. He investigates the murder of an, a prominent art dealer in San Francisco. The catch is the people who might be involved in this art dealer's murder is Trina Gavin. Trina Gavin is a psychologist played by Linda Fiorentino. She is what you what you can actually ultimately guess at the beginning of the movie. She might be a, a woman that he really was in love with at one time or might still be in love with. But the catch is Trina Gavin, played by Linda Fiorentino, she's married to actually Matt Gavin. Matt Gavin is a high-powered lawyer, much richer than David Corelli, a very rich, powerful man in San Francisco, played by a Bronx Tale writer and actor, Chaz Palminteri. That's the movie. There's Richard Crenna from... Rambo, he plays Governor Edwards. There are other people here. There's Michael Bean. He plays a police detective, Bob Hargrove. Michael Bean, he's always great. Yes, Eric Holmes, for your podcast listeners, he actually raised a thumb, th- thumbs up to Michael Bean. So he's very supportive of Michael Bean. I am supportive. I'm sure Bruce Berkey is supportive of, my, of Michael Bean as well. My only thing about Michael Bean with this one is before he actually does a performance, his mustache in this movie actually walked into the scene before he did which was amazing, amazing mustache by Michael Bean. I hope that was a real mustache he was sporting. So very, and also Angie Everhart 
is also a very memorable character in this movie. She plays this woman named Patrice Jacinto. All you need to know about Joe Estrahas is Jay. If, if Joe Estrahas, if you've seen Sliver or Basic Instinct, you're going to know a couple things. Jade is going to have a lot of sex or maybe some sex, some violence, maybe sex and violence intermingled. It's an erotic thriller. It's a mystery thriller. It's a lot of things. We're going to get into it right now. First off, let's start off with Eric Holmes. You've seen Jade a couple of times. As of recently, you saw it, I believe, a couple of months ago. So you're actually the expert regarding Jade. Your overall thoughts on the movie. Watching Jade, I keep forgetting it that it's a William Friedkin movie. I keep thinking it's a Brian De Palma movie because it kind of has a lot of the hallmarks, uh, minus probably the split diopter um, that I don't recall one in this. Uh, maybe there is, and I missed it. But uh, I, I got this. I got the sense that uh, William Friedkin probably like watched like a, I don't know, a Body Double or or you know, probably just watched like a bunch of Brian De Palma movies and go, I want to do one of those. And then Joe Esther House is like, hey, I got something for you. And it's like, sweet. And then uh, Jade was born from that. I don't know if that's the case, but that's kind of what it feels like. A lot of the plot is kind of uh, hard to follow for the most part. It's kind of one of those uh, mystery things where plots are pretty much hard to follow. But what I liked about it was, first of all, uh, the car chases. I mean... That's kind of, it, it seems that that's William Freakin's bread and butter, especially in this and the hunted. There's some awesome car chases. There's one particular part where someone gets hit by a car. There's like that stunt. Uh, I think, think you probably know what I'm talking about. Well, the word, um, there's something, yeah, someone gets hit by a car. And, and the camera state, like, it, it, it's not like a cutaway thing. <laughs> that's, that's a straight up stunt. It, it's a pretty freaking amazing stunt i yeah, kind of goes through chi the chinese new year's parade it goes through the docks it goes through a lot of different scenes in the movie no no be before that not linda fiorentino but uh i i think it was jade that gets hit by the gets hit by the the car oh well, she's right, like right, sitting wait, there wait. and then you hear the car and look over boom and then she just goes right. flying and it's like one shot it, it looks freaking amazing i i think they cut enough to get a stunt double in there but whoever that stunt double is, kudos to them because they, they had to have taken a hit. Uh, <laughs> I, I can't see any way that anyone could do that stunt and just not get just royally effed up. We're going to talk but about I, spoilers. Who, who does get hit? It might not, might, it's probably not Jade. We'll, we're not going to give away who gets hit. Oh, sorry. I, I, but I, 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 thought, I thought this was. <laughs> we're <gonna> do... <laughs> sorry. Okay. No worries. No worries. <laughs> Someone Cut gets hit. Let's out. just say someone gets hit. Someone Cut gets hit. Someone out. gets hit by a car. Someone gets hit by a car. Yeah. But then it leads to the yeah. It starts off with hit on the on the street, and then it leads to the Chinese New Year's parade and to the end of the docks. It's a one big elongated sequence. It's the money now, shot. One one of the big reasons. Now, not the only reason to see Jay. So, yes, yeah, sir. So that scene you're talking about the uh, the car chase, the slow ass car chase. Yeah. I remember watching Way of the Gun for the first time. And I was uh, blown away by that movie, especially the uh, one mile an hour car chase in the alley in Way of the Gun. I don't know uh, how long it's been since you've seen it. It's been forever. Uh, watch but, it again. but they're they're in an alley and they're just kind of slowly like they're not even driving the car. They're bringing their foot outside the car and pushing the car with their foot. That's how slow they're going. I was like, oh, that's so brilliant. You just have a really tense a really tense car chase and they're hardly you know they're barely going a mile an hour and then to watch jade and go oh i wonder i wonder if that's where chris mccrory got the slow ass car chase idea oh, because i, I it, you know you, you have the cars where they're like speeding through and crashing through everything but then you got that thing where um like they're barely idling the car by because there's so many people around and they're just trying to you know but uh yeah, it, it, it's good stuff. And William Friedkin's kind of, he, he's, I think he's kind of an underrated action director. Like like people think of uh, Friedkin, uh, well, no, because they, they bring up the French connection. And of but course, what I, he did I, with Sorcerer, with the, big, with, the, with the tank, with the gas, with that kerosene, the gasoline thing. I, yeah, like, but. To I, live and die in LA. You've seen yeah. the chase and to live and die in LA. Yeah, but I, I don't know that, and I could be wrong, but I don't feel that William Friedkin's known as an action director. And he's yeah. freaking fantastic at directing action. Yeah. You know, he, he gets the he gets the uh, geography down. 
he gets the tension down, tells the story within, you know, within these action set pieces. Granted, a car chase has nothing to do with the uh, erotic thriller plot that, you know, has very little to do with yeah. the erotic thriller part. But it like, yeah, it, it it's great stuff. Well, you know, Eric was talking has it has, Bruce, it has nothing to do. And that scene is obligatory. That car chase seems obligatory within the whole fabric of the Jade narrative. And this movie is exactly what Eric was saying about how it, it reminded me of Brian De Palma. It, the opening shots where we we witness the the remains or the the killing of that art dealer, the the post effect of it. We were actually drawn in via I guess, rear window style. So there's a lot of Hitchcock and De Palma references at the beginning of the movie. The movie is scored by the late, late composer, James Horner. James Horner is kind of doing his own kind of very spooky suspense thriller kind of score as well. There's a lot of really things, really cool things to love about it. But ultimately there's a lot of mixtures of, I don't, there's a, just a, a whole bunch of ingredients. And I'm wondering if it made a good meal for you, Bruce, ultimately. Um, well, I think I'm the only person that probably saw this in the theater, which I did actually <laughs> didn't remember it very well. It's been a long time, but, um, uh, watching it on the second time, uh, it's kind of enjoyable despite itself. It's kind of, how I felt, I, I think this movie is, uh, it's kind of a mess. Uh, it's about as Joe Esther Housey as you can get. I mean, in, in a lot of ways, this is a kind of movie that just doesn't get made at all anymore. If you think about it, like the erotic thriller is pretty much, uh, a dated thing as far yeah. as movies go. In fact, that's the kind of my overall impression of this. This is a really a dated movie in a lot of ways. It's kind of preposterous. It kind of doesn't make a lot of sense. And I think it could be really enjoyable for that reason. I think you could really enjoy it almost as a camp movie from bygone days, because I thought about this and I was watching it. I was like, what else came out this year? And I looked and I was like, this came out the same year as seven seven seems like a modern movie. This seems like a dated movie. In my opinion, I look at this movie and I think this could have been made in 1982, you know? So uh, it's enjoyable. It's kind of silly. Some of the acting is definitely dubious. And when we act about who that person is, Jade or not Jade, there's a scene with her, which is just ridiculously written where it's just like one of those scenes where it's like, it's like, and yes, they know her as Jade, you know, there's like, the, it's like, it's like those like really like expository moments. Um, it's fun. It's silly. I, I couldn't, have, I wouldn't recommend it to people who want a seriously made tightly wound, I guess, procedural because it doesn't make a lot of sense. You could, you could poke a billion holes in this movie. And as far as the chase goes, I wasn't really down for the chase. I think the chase was kind of like, um, Oh, really? That's a Yeah. That, I think the chase amazing. was like, it was like about four different cliches in one, especially the the the, the scene going through the, the parade. I mean, to me, that has been overdone so many times. I mean, how many James Bond movies alone have had a chase through a parade? You know, it's going, just like, going a mile an hour. I would say only yeah, one. And that movie is called Way of the Gun. <laughs> I think this usually is they're my... not in a, a car, but I mean, it was just, I mean, I found it. I found it pretty silly. I'll be I honest. The, I I, you found it silly. I, I I recommend. I actually recommend Jade simply for the car chase. I simply. I yeah. said th- this movie is ninety five minutes. Watch this movie for the car chase. Watch this movie because it is silly in certain spots. Big the big minus of this movie, in my opinion. Okay, Linda Fiorentino as Katrina Gavin. She's a very smart actress. She doesn't act anymore. She hasn't acted in probably for a while for the last 12, 14 years, and she hasn't really been big since the nineties. She started in Last Seduction, really interesting, good movie. And she was in Dogma. She's been in a whole bunch of Men in Black, a whole bunch of other movies. She's supposed to play this really sexual dynamo who may or may not be Jade. And she's a woman who's supposed to attract so many men. She attracts her, obviously, her husband. She is the, she attracts David Corelli, played by David Caruso. And I don't know, I, I believed her as a psychologist. And maybe it's my own taste. I just didn't feel the chemistry with Fiorentino in Jade. I didn't, I, I felt not, no chemistry between her and Palminteri. I felt zero chemistry with her and Caruso. And this movie is supposed to be a sexy thing. I don't blame her. I, got I don't blame her. I don't blame her. I blame them. <laughs> I the would script. say, one, uh, her chemistry between her and Palminteri is of fear because, or, or distance because they're like married, but they're not 
the, the, the chemistry is not supposed to be there because they're they're kind of you know together but not really um it's more like a power yeah. play situation right yeah yeah and her chemistry is not there with david caruso because david caruso his chemistry is with the camera because this movie <laughs> is david caruso the movie i yeah i'm trying to i'm trying to think of if there's anyone more perfect than david Car- like i i can't i can't even put my finger on it this movie was straight up made for david caruso you bring up a great point. Another reason why to see this movie is if you love David Caruso. This is a David yes. Caruso movie. There is no one who plays the, hey, everyone move away because I own the joint kind of feeling that David Caruso gives off. He gave that feeling off in King of New York, even though he had he was one of the supporting characters. He actually almost stole that movie with his, with his character playing the cop. Also, this is such a David Caruso movie is because he plays David Corelli an assistant DA, but you don't, you don't believe he's a lawyer in Jade. You think he's a cop. He, he's actually, it's like, he's playing a cop. He's more of a cop in this movie than the Michael Bean character. Okay. So I thought that was really pretty interesting. Yeah. It, it does have some value added because of the David Caruso performance. I thought he did. David Caruso was doing David Caruso things with Jade. And I kind of, I kind of like that as well. David Caruso is playing a cop. That may be why he's hamming it up. i would say (laughs) i would defend uh linda fiorentino as well to say that kind of exactly what eric said which is neither of those two male actors is really supposed to be someone that she has this smoldering relationship with anymore you know what i mean yeah so i don't think expecting that from her in this role is really part of the deal in fact we're not seeing her that way with anybody in this movie. She actually is, it's only kind of in tale about her, you know, like in legend, we don't actually really see her in that situation, like in the moment. So I don't blame her in that. Sense. I, and, and once again, I'd say the script is kind of part of that too. So if you can buy into some of the silliness and some of the, the weird narrative threads in Jade, I think I would recommend this movie. It, it comes with a, the caveat of it is a little bit, incoherent at times eric was talking about the plot and whatnot it's a lot of that stuff is secondary and it does doesn't really feel eric made another good point he was kind of wondering he was he forgot that it's directed by william friedkin it doesn't really feel like a pure friedkin movie apart from some of the the cop chases and or the gritty questioning stuff but i i did like this as an overall experiment even though it's flawed i liked it so much that i purchased for 10 bucks on amazon prime video i purchased jade the director's cut and during our spoilers i'm just going to really mention what i thought of i didn't really re-watch the the jade director's cut i actually purchased it and watched some of the extra 12 minutes that were added and i'll talk about that during our spoilers section so final go round regarding jade i give it a recommendation even with all its flaws i enjoyed the film bruce no recommendation or recommendation for you uh i would recommend it as a camp watch camp watch eric good one eric holmes how about you yeah, I, I'd, I'd probably recommend it. I mean, it was pretty pretty fun to watch. And uh, there's, a, I mean, if you like the erotic thrillers, this is pretty good. Uh, I did not watch the uh, director's cut, though. I did not watch the director's cut of Jade. That might be because I'm kind of green. Yeah! <laughs> very good. <laughs> Sorry, I, I was really it's reaching for a pun. By there. the way, we love David Caruso. He was also but, uh, good. He was also good in Mad Dog and Glory. But, we love, but David yeah, this, this yeah. is this is three thousand percent David Caruso's movie. And if you at all like David Caruso or are at all interested in David Caruso, this is if you only watch one thing with David Caruso in it, it should be this because this is the most David Caruso movie, probably the most David Caruso anything I've seen. He's also good in this movie called Kiss of Death starring Nicolas Cage, which I haven't seen in in a while. I definitely would love to rewatch that David Caruso film. Also, before we get to The Hunted, The Hunted and Jade, they're both streaming as of this recording on Paramount+. Plus, So you can definitely see both William Friedkin films streaming on Paramount+. Plus. Obviously, we Eric Holmes has, I believe, both. you have both DVDs. They're both available on Blu-ray and DVD. The, the reason why I purchased... Again, Jade, the director's cut, is they don't even have it on DVD or Blu-ray, which is, I found kind of really weird. That director's cut isn't even featured as a special feature. So, okay, we'll get back to that spoilers towards the end of the podcast. Now, let's get to The Hunted, okay? Now, The Hunt, the Hunted was released eight years later. 1995 was Jade. 2003 was 
The Hunted. And here is the plot line. Quote, an FBI Deep Woods tracker, played by Tommy Lee Jones, attempts to capture a trained assassin, played by Del- Benicio Del Toro, who has made a sport of hunting humans. Directed again by William Friedkin, again starring Tommy Lee Jones, Benicio Del Toro. What this plot line doesn't tell you is at the beginning of the movie, we are introduced to Aaron Hallam, played by Del Toro. He is an assassin. He is sort of this special ops guy. And unlike all his other members, he's not just front and center. He's the guy who actually gets in and out. He is a trained assassin. And he's the movie opens up in Kosovo and he's he's tasked with taking out this, their Serbian leader. So we spent about 10, nine to 10 minutes in that flashback sequence in the middle of war. And as you can see in the village, there are innocent kids and, and family members. They're getting they're, they're, they're Albanians and they're getting slaughtered. And obviously this, this war incident has a triggering effect, a PTSD effect on Aaron Hallam. He is a trained killer. When he comes back to society, he's trained to kill and hunt. The problem is, can he shut that off? He can't. And Tommy Lee Jones plays LT Bonham, the tracker who actually trained Aaron Hallam to become a killer. Here's a here's the funny thing is LT Bonham has never killed a person in his life. He's only trained these soldiers to kill. It's it's a it's a really interesting dynamic. This is a guy who hasn't gone to war, but he teaches people how to actually track and kill without ever having killed a human. So that is the main crux of the hunted when Aaron Hallam becomes with his PTSD when he ends up killing people and becoming a menace to the world society, it's up to LT Bonham to track his former protege down hunt him down and hopefully kill him or bring him to justice. Also starring Connie Nielsen as an FBI agent and a bunch of other people, Mark Pellegrino as Dale Hewitt, an FBI agent, a bunch of other really interesting character actors. Bruce Perky, I want to know what you think of The Hunted. Underrated, overrated, half-baked. What do you think? I would definitely say it's underrated. I But see, okay, this is a tough one because some people just won't like this movie. This is a really stripped down lean action movie and kind of like we talked about with some other movies if you want to if you want to pick at it there are definitely some things that are not very realistic but that's not exactly what you're going to this movie for and one of the things that i really really liked about it are uh is the almost all the set pieces are done out on location you know they're either on the streets of portland they're in the forests of northwest they're there's a variety of places they occur, but they're not on sound stages and you really feel that. And I think that adds a, a sense of, I don't know, veracity to it. Cause if you, like I said, if you pick apart some of the little pieces, you'll be like, eh, wait, wait, what did that character do that for? That's not very realistic, but you kind of forgive it because everything else is so grounded as far as the locations and settings and all that. And the biggest, I guess, key of a movie, movie like this is two really strong characters you know, you know where they're coming from and a character that's essentially the villain that they're constantly giving you reasons to like understand him. So it's like, he's, you kind of want him to be redeemed. You kind of want, so that's, that's really key. I think to a movie like this, it's not just straight bad guy. There's, there's some elements to there, which I think enrich it. And then last but not least, I love how Tommy Lee Jones, we talk about how he hasn't killed and all this, but over <laughs> time and time again in this movie, he'll keep going in with nothing. No gun, no knife. Uh, there's one point at the early on where he goes to track Benicio for its character for the first time. And he doesn't have anything. You don't know how long he's going to be out there in the woods. He has like just a shirt in his pants. And I'm just like, you're going to die of hypothermia, dude. You don't have nothing. <laughs> and he just goes in. And he keeps going into scenes like this where uh, it's almost comical, but you kind of believe it too. Or it's almost comical where it's like Tommy Lee Jones has nothing. You're like, dude, you're kind of getting to be an older guy. You're, you have no chance here. How are you going to make this work? But you also kind of believe it when you see it go down. So uh, I thought a lot of fun with this movie. I think it's real, like I said, streamlined, pure action, pure thriller. Uh, if you kind of like that kind of movie, I don't know how you wouldn't like this movie. There, there are parts in this movie where there's no dialogue, where it's just Tommy Lee Jones, Benicio Del Toro, one's chasing the other, one's trying to elude the other person. And it's just sh- shots of them in the wilderness. We talked about the car chase and Jade. There is a chase in this movie that I think is actually better than Jade. And I love Jade. There is a there is a walking, driving sequence, chase sequence that I think is fantastic and overlooked. Eric Holmes, what did you think overall of The Hunted? High on your list for a free game. 
You know, Greg, I, I have to agree with Bruce there. I believe this movie should play in every outhouse, whorehouse, hen house, and shit house. <laughs> um, yeah, the, this movie's pretty pretty stripped down, and it, it you know it, it's uh, have a nineties action movie. Uh, did this come out in the nineties or was this two thousand? This is two thousand three. Okay, yeah. well, it feels, so like, for, like, it feels like a nineties thing, right? Yeah. Yeah, I I got a little nostalgia just just because it's uh, pretty much like the fugitive. I mean, it, it's kind of the same kind of same wheelhouse. This one's a little better because it's in the forest, so you get the uh, you got a lot of the greens and uh, kind of kind of similar to when I was watching a uh, sorcerer or uh, not a Will and Freakin movie, but Romancing the Stone. I'm like every movie from this era needs to be shot in a forest or a jungle. Um, <laughs> But uh, th- yeah, this one is is pretty fun. Kind of uh, kind of similar to First Blood, but without like the the emotional weight um, that First Blood has. I, I think a lot of people forget that First Blood gets pretty heavy emotionally. This has moments of that, but mostly it's uh, you know th- this one's just kind of a fun sort of uh, action movie. Real simple. Not not much uh, to add to what you guys said. Other than that final, like, is it spoiler to say that there's a final fight in this? Yeah, we'll we'll get to the final <laughs> fight. Yeah, there's there's there is a final not, fight. Not, there's it's inevitable. Okay. That's not a spoiler. The, the fact the fact the fact that I can say that there's a final fight, I, I can say what I'm what I was getting at. That thing was fucking awesome. Yeah, <laughs> that, I, I was like, because uh, I I'd seen this movie a long a, a while ago, and then just rewatching it recently for this. I'm like, God damn, that thing is so good. And there, there's a couple, a couple parts in particular shots that they do. And again, that's that's uh, Will and Freakin being a fucking dynamite action director. The the fights between them, like, and to Bruce's point, there's stuff in this that doesn't make sense. Like, you know, if you're a cop or a detective or whatever, you're gonna watch this go. Ain't how we do it. <laughs> but overall, I, I dig this one a lot. And this is uh, kind of a, th- this one feels like one of those meat and potatoes type movie. There's not a lot of extra, you know, stuff. It's just salt, pepper on the on the steak, and that's all you need. And it's delicious. Bruce, you were talking about the stripped down narrative. I end the idea with the antagonist. You you kind of, uh, not, I'm not saying you feel for him, but you understand sort of the, the shadings of his character. Okay, good and bad. I thought this was really interesting because the protagonist, Tommy Lee Jones's character, it comes into question about the high, the idea of the father and son. He is sort of a father figure to Benicio's character. And one has to ponder throughout the narrative, did this hero of the story actually fail the antagonist, actually? And that's one of the, the themes that I probably freaking do, doesn't really overblow because this is pretty much a, a stripped down narrative, but I really like that element where you're actually thinking, you know what, you are the protagonist, but there are things that you've done that maybe you should have paid attention to. Did you like that element as well, that he's not just a clear cut, perfect protagonist? Yes, absolutely. In fact, I was going to mention because Eric mentioned the fugitive and that's kind of a key difference, right? In the fugitive, the whole idea is that you have a totally wronged person that's being, you know, being uh, pursued. And he's constantly trying to prove that, hey, I did do anything wrong and I'm just trying to, you know, clear my name. Whereas here, you know, Benicio's character has done a lot of these things and he is dangerous and he is kind of on the edge. But what you're saying about Tommy Lee Jones character, now that is really interesting. And there's a key scene in the middle of this. This isn't a spoiler. There's a key scene in the middle of this where it has a flashback and it shows the training and he's showing how he's training, like how to effectively totally kill somebody with all these slashes and you cut this artery, cut this artery, and then stab up through the sternum and get the heart and all this stuff. And as you're watching it, you've already got the context of what Benicio has become. And you kind of get this feeling that, you know, Tommy Lee Jones character, even though it's not, like you said, it's not very explicit that there's kind of this idea, like I've created these monsters, you know, and he's kind of like, I've sent these guys out there. They're, they do this stuff and they're totally unequipped to, kind of come back to the world, you know, what do they do now? So I think that that is an interesting subtext. is isn't really required because like Eric says, it's meat and potatoes. This is an action movie for first and foremost, you know, a thriller, but those little parts are really great. And last thing, oh, I was glad you mentioned um, <laughs> First Blood because I wanted to mention, think about the last movie. We had Krenna and Caruso who are both in First Blood. 
So that's a nice little thing. <laughs> and <laughs> um, I, um, oh shoot, I lost my train of thought. I'll come back to it. I have something else I was going to bring up, but it, I, it'll come I, I will. I will add that the only thing wrong with this movie is that Krana and Caruso was not in The Hunted. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. That's what I was going to say. Oh, no, I'll shut up and let you guys talk. But I also, I think that if you look at the two movies and you guys may or may not agree with me, agree with me on this, I feel like part of the thing we're talking about with Jade is I feel like there were so many strong personalities there between Caruso and Esther House's writing and Friedkin that even though you can see him a little bit there, I think he gets lost a little bit in that process. And I feel like you don't quite get that Friedkin feeling from it. This one feels like freaking had control over this you know what i mean it's like he's controlling the look and the feel and the style and the the mood of this movie i feel like it's really strong so this is called the i i have here the freaking connection i borrowed it at my local library and he was saying this in his in his actually auto auto bio and he was saying he felt disappointed with jade he felt that he disappointed the higher ups in paramount he was married he still is married to Sherry Lansing. I think for a while she was head of the studio. He said he he felt like he he did some of his, of his best work in Jade. And what's interesting is the two or three pages he he actually talks about Jade. He doesn't talk about the performances. He doesn't talk about the story. What does he talk about, Eric? What do you think he talks about as far as it, best work? David Caruso and the two mile an hour car chase. And the fact that there was a Warner Enterprises trailer in there. <laughs> yes. He, t- he basically talks about the car chase throughout, throughout, for the two, two pages. And he was saying he feels like some of his best work, but he f- actually he felt disappointed. The movie bombed and he felt like he disappointed the people over Paramount. Now with The Hunted, his overall just post comments on this that movie, he was proud of it. He, he thought he did well with pacing and the, the drama. I thought this was, like, to your point, Bruce, this, was, this felt more like a William Friedkin movie. The great thing about William Friedkin is this movie probably had a certain budget. It was, can you imagine a, a major studio releasing The Hunted today? That wouldn't that wouldn't happen. It would be like straight to Netflix or straight to Hulu. It wouldn't be a theatrical release anymore. It's amazing that back in 2003, these were the kind of movies that were being released on a weekend. So I miss those type of movies, stripped down. But William Friedkin was still able to do some really great action sequences like you were mentioning, Eric. A lot of action sequences in The Hunted. For me, to be honest, it's one of my favorite freaking films. Is it does it reach sorcerer or the French connection status? No, but I mean, I I put this right up there as far as underrated, like Killer Joe type, like as far as, as far as underseen, underappreciated films from William Friedkin. This is right, The Hunted is right up at the top. Eric Holmes, yes. I I I don't think it's really fair to compare this like to the Exorcist, like to his his you know sorcerer and Exorcist because. Um, much like Sorcerer, you know, Sorcerer was supposed to be suspenseful, and that's exactly what it is. Uh, the uh, the Hunted is supposed to be a, a action kind of thriller, and that's like Hunted is exactly what the movie needs to be. It gets a little silly sometimes. There was a uh, a fight in a like a warehouse that stores steam, I guess. That that part was a little <laughs> silly, but, uh, but you know that that's kind of you know it, it's not perfect, but it's it's the kind of you know it's just a distilled movie. This the hunted is exactly the movie that I think it was trying to be, and I think it's successful at it. It doesn't really try to add a bunch of frills in it, and quite honestly, if it did, I think it would hurt the movie because it, this seems like a. a a cat and mouse, Tommy Lee Jones looking in every outhouse, whorehouse, penthouse, uh, looking for uh, Benicio del Toro. And if you add a bunch of extraneous stuff in it, you know, like Jade, that has a bunch of extraneous stuff in it, but that kind of is part and parcel with those type of movies. You know, the the Brian the Palma type, you know, with erotic thrillers, you know, you need all that that excess extra plot that no one can follow because that's kind of part of the genre. And it's, it's weird that you brought up that uh, Jade was a failure and the hunted was the one that he was like, what, what did you say that he he, said he was disappointed with Jade the way it did at the box office, but he felt like he failed them by not making it a hit. Uh, but he said, he, he said it's some of his best work that he's done. But it, it was right. interesting. It was telling that the best work that he was talking about in those two pages for Jade, he was only mentioning the car chase sequence. So I I remember when Jade came out in theaters. I didn't see it in theaters. I don't know how old I was, but I thought Jade was a bigger movie 
maybe for for some yeah. reason I, I i thought that was a hit but apparently no. not it was, a, it was a big and thing. i think uh, it kind of killed caruso didn't it didn't it kind of kill caruso oh. and he basically came back to what is it uh csi and stuff or whatever yeah. it was he uh, went back to television ultimately i mean he... I, i'm just a young spring chicken i don't quite remember that well but no but the, my my recollection was that jade was a big hit back in the day but apparently yeah. not and that the hunted i remember that came out i for some reason i remember that getting shit on a lot so yeah, I, you're right I, you're right that movie didn't do any any good business at all for paramount but it's one of those movies that over the years that it's garnered a lot more love it's one of those in posterity, the hunted keeps on growing and growing as far yeah. as his own body of work, especially. So I think that, I mean, I saw the hunted probably back in the day in 2003, and I thought it was exactly like you said, Eric, a stripped down thriller that I thought was underappreciated. And 17 years later, I feel the same way, but I like it even more. This is one of those movies I can keep on watching over and over again, because it's, it really fits my sensibilities. So for me, the hunted is a really strong recommendation for me, Bruce, so, solid recommend for you. Yeah, yeah, especially if you're an action fan, I think it's it's really good. If you if you want a lot more character, it, it's not super duper complex. It's like we said, it's simple. But if you like a good straight ahead action movie with no frills, it's it's right up there. It's good. All right, and Eric, strong recommend, solid recommend for you for for this yep. one for the hunted. Everything Bruce said and everything you said, I am thumbs up on. <laughs> All right, now let's. That's it. That is the end of our podcast. We're gonna quickly talk about the spoilers so listeners thank you so much for supporting us here on find your film again we will have links on our podcast show notes for amazon associates we're amazon associates members so if you rent or purchase any of these movies use our links we get a small commission okay that said that out of the way now jade i downloaded the director's cut last night saw the deleted scenes now we're going to get to the spoilers of jade at the end of jade first of all what did you guys think about about the end of Jade, where the where the killer and the killer of the art dealer ended up being Chaz Palminteri's character, and it actually didn't end up being Michael Bean or his cronies or the right hand man of the governor? Did you like that little twist at the end when the actual real culprit was Chaz Palminteri and not those other guys? Yeah, well, I, I will say yes because I know you're going to add to this. <laughs> Yeah, were you surprised initially, Eric, when you saw it when that it was Chaz? After all, he was no, the one who actually okay. Not not so much, and and that's not because I saw it coming. But um, like I mentioned before, Jade's one of those movies where I'm kind of just in the world and enjoying the characters and watching the ridiculousness of it all. I'm not paying that much attention to the plot. So when the, the when the twist comes, I'm like, oh, okay, that's cool. But you mentioned something that you'll get to that I, 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 yes. I did like quite a bit. And Bruce, what do you think of the ending with it when Chaz is actually the real killer? And if he was kind of, yeah, sorry, if he was a real killer, shouldn't he have made sure that his wife was a little bit more safe towards the end? I mean, what? It's so wow. Yeah, it, I mean, once again, like Eric says, it, it's like this isn't really a logical kind of thing. And I think this kind of movie also that that kind of ending isn't if it really surprises you and it's like, wow, my mind is blown, then I don't know. You're not really watching these kind of movies because <laughs> it's one of those movies where it's like there's no reason for his character to even be in the movie if he's not somehow involved. Right. Like because he doesn't do anything really in the movie. It's like, why is his character so big? Oh, why is he a known person? Well, he's involved somehow. So you kind of assume he's involved in some way. And then they they have that whole thing where they show his little cuff link at the beginning. You know, so it's like, oh, that's going to come into play at some point. No, it didn't throw me off that much. I was like, eh, okay, he's the guy. So the original ending, and listeners, we're assuming you've already seen Jade or you don't mind spoilers. The original ending has everyone, uh, the cronies of, obviously the bad people were the governor because the governor played by Richard Crenna, he was, he actually was implicated in, he was possibly a, sus a suspect in the killing of the arm, the art dealer because the art dealer had incriminating photos of people, the higher ups in San Francisco in compromising positions with various, various people. And you know, Chaz Palminteri's character, Lenny Fiorentino's character, they play the Gavins. They were part of it. The governor was part of this whole sex kind of game kind of situation of Jade. So you're thinking throughout the entire movie that it's the governor and his cronies who actually are killed, A, killed the art dealer and were dispatching of everyone else that were involved in the art dealer's world. They're half right because the, ultimately it's the governor who sends his right-hand man, played by Holt 
McCallany, you might not know the name, but when you see his face, you've seen him in a million things. There's also Michael Bean's character, who was the cop. And there's another guy who plays a young lawyer who's hardly in the movie. Those are the three bad guys at the end who try ultimately to, to kill, to get rid of Linda Fiorentino, Chaz Palminteri, and, and David Crusoe. So it's like a three-on-three situation. Ultimately, those three cronies are brought to justice. Two of them, I believe, yeah, two of them get killed. So the ending of the movie has has Matt Gavin played by Chaz Palminteri being the bad guy. And it ends with him, I guess, him and his wife, Trina Gavin, played by Linda Fiorentino, playing, still continuing to play their chess games of a relationship. And ultimately, it's a sad ending because, you know, Trina Gavin will probably, she knows she's married, to, A, she's married to a killer, and B, because he has all this incriminating ed- evidence on her as being Jade and whatnot, you're actually assuming that she might end up in this relationship that she really doesn't want to be in for the rest of her life. And that's the end. That's the end of Jade. So that's kind of a really downer, sexually deviant, perverse ending. And you know what? David Caruso's character, the attorney, he thinks he caught the killers, but he didn't. His killer was his best friend. So all of that, those threads are left dangling. And <laughs> if you were fine with that ending, you were fine with that kind of downbeat ending. And Eric, yeah, eh? Eric, you're fine. You were fine with that downbeat ending, right? Yeah. Again, I I didn't think too much about it. It, it happened. I'm like, it, I'm like, okay, yeah, that that's cool. But I, thought, I, I mean, that that wasn't the reason I I, I, I watch a movie like this. I, I love that ending. I love that downbeat ending because the killer does pretty much gets away with it. He gets to keep his wife, and and he actually emotionally. You're assuming he's going to emotionally terrorize her for the rest of her life. That's the end of Jade. Fade out. Okay. <laughs> great. Great downbeat ending. Maybe that's why Friedkin kept that. Did what? Maybe he didn't because that director, quote unquote, director's cut, which is ninety-seven, which is one hundred seven minutes, twelve minutes longer than the original theatrical cut. It actually has the, the original ending. The director's cut has Trina Gavin, and and she sees all the photos that Matt Gavin has of her in compromising positions. She realizes Matt confesses that he's the murderer. But while they're having this conversation outside their manor, outside their mansion, is. David Caruso in his in his car, David, playing David Corelli, he is actually listening in on their conversation. It's on tape. It's on it, like you said, it would lose the flower of evil. It's on a cassette deck. Okay, so the end has him stopping the recorder and actually leaving the car and heading towards the house, and assuming that he's going to probably arrest or actually have his best friend Matt Galvin arrested. That is how the original director's cut of Jade ends. Yes, Eric. Now, I do need to watch this again with the director's cut because the way you're describing that sounds like one of my favorite endings of... uh, I don't know if this is my favorite ending ever, but this is up there. But the ending of Taking of Pelham 1, 2, 3, Mm -hmm. where you have the, the whole movie going... And then uh, he's talking to, uh, he's uh, talking to, uh, I forget the actor's name at the end. Nathan and Shaw, Robert Shaw. Shaw. Ro- Robert Shaw. Yeah. Okay. And he's talking to him and we know we're watching it. We know that he was going to spoil the taking of Pelham one, two, three, be careful. <laughs> yeah, oh 30, yeah. 36 they, years they, later. They, 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 thanks for, thanks for catching me. But <laughs> there there's dude, Bruce, something similar, so, <laughs> something similar might occur. We're not sure that, that, that there was, there was a thing where uh, someone gives a look and it's just real quick and roll credits. And, you know, we, okay. we had seen the whole movie up to that point. We just needed that look. And that tells us everything we need to know and roll credit. What you're describing with that alternate ending to Jade sounds like almost that exact thing. Where it's like you get you get just that little bit of extra information, and it's like, oh, okay, that and and you just kind of put put the rest of the pieces together. The original cut of Jade of Jade had Dave Corelli and Trina Gavin, David Caruso, and Linda Linda Fiorentino. It's actually inferred. Remember, inferred that they may have been together, right? It's kind of inferred that they had a chemistry before. The director's cut. You have Chaz Palminteri and David Caruso talking in church, and they're and David and uh, Chaz Palminteri was saying, "Hey, you know what? My wife said that you were really bad in bed." So they actually have a line where you know that David Corelli and Trina Gavin actually 
had, were in a relationship, sexual relationship. So there's a couple of little things. The third person who was killed, a young attorney, there's a, a young attorney scene that's fleshed out a little bit more. So it's a more fleshed out film. Still, originally, my my same feelings of Jade, still, same, still is the same with uh, the Jade director's cut. Still enjoyed the movie, but I thought this ending was really interesting. Did you, what do you think of that? Do you like that ending uh, better, Bruce, over the original ending or? Either or. I've actually, since Eric mentioned it, I, I've actually decided what the true ending should be. And the true ending should be the sequence of the girl in the forest with the tape recorder in a reverie from <laughs> Lose the Flower of Evil. But out of the tape is coming the conversation from the end of Jade. <laughs> that, that's amazing. And now, so that is that is it for Jade. All right, Bruce, repeat that, but slower. <laughs> but slower, like the car chase scene. Okay. Now, for the hunted, there's nothing else to really say about the hunted except that Eric was alluding to it. There is a final sequence, I guess, by a, a top of the mountain or something. And then there's like a waterfall situation. There is a hand to hand combat combat with sort of man made knives. They have, they have a great. That's montage. what I want to I want to mention that. I want to talk about that. Yeah, let's talk about that. There, did you like it, that whole scene when they like a rocky scene instead of training? They're each making their own knives by the. Uh, no, by the it's organ. more like Predator. <laughs> yeah, like, like Predator. Right, right. And ultimately, they I was go. Hand- say, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I was yeah, going to say, um, that's the part I think is so preposterous, like, because it's like, you don't know how much time has passed. And he's like forging a knife. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. OK, it, it, it is a little bit improbable. How can Tommy Lee Jones and Benicio Del Toro, how can their characters make really great A knives within a span of two seconds? Eric, is that possible? You're you're a man of nature, um, you're a man of crafts. What now, with, with uh, Tommy Lee Jones's knife, the uh, he uh, took the rock and basically chipped the rock. Yeah, that that would work. And that would actually work really well because rocks are dirty. Uh, there's a lot of bacteria in the little pores and everything. So every time he stabbed them, I'm like, and he must have stabbed them like 100 times like throughout, you know, throughout the duration of the fight. Benicio Del Toro walks away from that he's not living very long because whatever bacteria was in that it, it, it's like the uh what what do they call those uh lizards the uh uh something dra- komodo dragon komodo yeah yeah they can bite you it's not, the bite's not going to kill you it's it's the thing that gets in the uh you know it's the bacteria that gets in the bite you know you're going to walk throughout the desert and uh, pass out you know, and die. And then the Komodo dragon's like, I'm gonna eat a human. <laughs> and so the rock knife might not be effective immediately in a fight, but it's gonna it's gonna be more effective, I think, in the long run. I could be wrong about that, but I'm pretty sure I'm right. Now, Benicio del Toro forging the uh forging <laughs> his knife. What is that? Um, That's like he's like a blacksmith, an expert blacksmith, along with being a great Kosovo assassin, right? What so, is that? so he he forged it, and you know he's kind of you know doing whatever he can with the tools he has, and that's fine. And then, then he dunks it, you know, take a red hot knife, dunk it in the water, and he hardened the steel, but he doesn't have a grinder, so his knife isn't sharp. So basically, you have a hardened slab of uh, just steel, which is fine for, uh, you know, just hitting people blunt, but it's not going to cut you. It's it, There's 0% chance that it's it's sharp enough to cut you in the way that they did in the movie. Oh, so I, I'm getting <laughs> I'm getting a little too uh, specific. You know, that's what we wanted. Yeah, yeah, you know what? Fuck. It would work. It would totally work. That, that's <laughs> so the, the ending. The ending is predictable. We have Tommy Lee Jones versus Benicio Del Toro. We all know that Tommy Lee Jones, who plays LT Bonham, ultimately kills Aaron Hallam after about several minutes. It's a very good fight. I, I would say it's a great fight. Great fight. Great fight. I kind of wanted a personally great fight. I was fine with the ending. I would have liked a Blade Runner ending where where you know what? LT bon- Tommy Lee Jones's character could has not killed someone. So maybe Aaron Hallam in, in his own way, excuse me one second while I cough, hold on, has the kill point. Yeah, he, he has that that the chance to kill LT Bonham. And he doesn't. I think I thought that would, would have been a cool and then we could have played with that in a certain way where where actually LT Bonham doesn't doesn't either either maybe the, the FBI agents kill Aaron Hallam, maybe from a, a distance, and maybe make the fight itself uh, very bring a little bit of dishonor to that fight. And then giving a little bit more dishonor to LT Bonham's character, because at the end of this movie, not only did his protege die at the hand of a bullet, which is probably against their whole idea of nature and the the way to live, but LT Bonham at the end of the movie still has not killed someone. I don't know. No, you know what? And and 
I mean, th- this is a bit of a rewrite of the end. They probably wouldn't work just because the movie's so, like, as we mentioned, this movie's so meat and potatoes that this would add probably a little too much. But to your point, well, first of all, the fact that uh, the, the scene where uh, he's teaching Benicio del Toro how to kill among the rest of the, the soldiers there, he's basically teaching Benicio del Toro how to kill him. <laughs> yeah. um which ultimately doesn't work but it so you say that he uh decides not to kill benicio and decide, del Toro. And it's like it, you know i did you know i essentially i'm responsible for this and i've never killed anyone i'm certainly not going to kill someone that um was a student of mine and so maybe they uh maybe they arrest benicio del, you know they they capture him you know, handcuff them, bring them. And then, uh, and then Tommy Lee Jones, you know, I never kill no one in my life except for myself. Oh, that's a, that's a, <laughs> that's an alternate. And the alternate I was saying was Aaron Hallam played by Del Toro. He actually has LT in his sights and he, he's going to kill him, but he doesn't, he does a blade runner. And instead for, he hesitates for a moment and he decides not to kill him and then just backs out and then maybe someone like the FBI agents they they throw a little bit of dishonor to the proceedings and they they just take out Benicio del Toro and LT Bonham realizes yes. that he could have died right right then and there but his protege decided not to kill him Bruce weigh in on this or does Benicio, Benicio like stop he pauses next to the the waterfall and then he has some kind of real poetic thing kind of like in Blade Runner where it's like I've seen the the fire, the flares <laughs> over the skies of Kosovo, and I've I've seen the Portland homeless <laughs> downtrodden, and then he slowly, like you know, goes <laughs> over the the waterfall with a Jesus Christ pose, like the mission, and then, yeah, and then he goes under the water, and you never you never see him again. Did he die? I don't know. That'll be interesting. And, and, and then Christopher in- McQuarrie leans in. In English, please. <laughs> <laughs> also, one final thing. At the end, we have him with the letters from Aaron Hallam, and he decides to throw the letters into the fire. And he's out there in his cabin, out in the middle of the wilderness. So he's going to move on from his life. That's fine, too. Again, it would have been cool, in my opinion. He had those letters, and he starts reading them. And maybe there's sort of an inf- it's inferred that he becomes even more haunted at the end of his actions. He doesn't become a killer, but it I would- weighs down on him. More. I would have had him like looking at the letters and then the pig walks in from outside and then he cooks a tart and eats the tart very slowly with the pig. <laughs> oh, very, very good. <laughs> Throwing in some movies from yes, yesteryear. All right. So that is it. Our mini pod review of The Hunted and Jade. Okay. So tell us what you think of these movies. And again, there's both streaming at Paramount Plus. We will see you next week. Anything you got to say, Eric, before we get out of here? Very big day. Uh, but William freaking, he's a man. He's the man. And Bruce, as always, we're ending the podcast with you. <laughs> no, this is yours today. This is yours. You get to end it. Okay, I'm. I, gonna, I've uh, talked enough. <laughs> I I don't know how to end end anything. I'll just say we will see you next week. Thank you supporting for supporting me, Eric, and Bruce here at the Find Your Film Podcast. Take care, guys. <laughs>